I uh, grew up just south of here uh, in Puyallup, Washington. And uh, yeah, we're here today to talk to you a little bit about Indigenous solidarity and um, some of the work we were doing. Um, so we are with a group called Deep Green Resistance, and I will tell you a little bit more about what we do, what we think, um, and how we are acting on what we think. But before I get started, it is uh, really important to acknowledge the fact that we are all settlers on stolen lands. Um, we wouldn't be here today were for 500 years of genocide against the indigenous peoples of this continent. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge our friend uh, Wasi Atui, who was supposed to be here with us doing this tour and um, speaking, but she came down with a case of bronchitis, mm -hmm. and so unfortunately was not able to make it. Um, but she, uh, since she couldn't be here, she sent us some material, and we've kind of incorporated it into our talk tonight. So, we're losing. As environmentalists, as people, as people who truly understand the dire predicament that we face, as people who really care about our land bases and the land bases of others, we're losing. It's been 50 years since Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, which many people, um, many people credit as the start to the modern environmental movement. Um, now, in the last 30 years, there hasn't been a single peer-reviewed scientific article that's been published that shows a living system that is improving, uh, let alone stable. Another way to put this uh, is something that uh, the, the late Sierra Club president, David Brower, said before he died. Uh, and he said, all I have done in my career is slow the rate at which things are getting worse. Not fair as repeating. All I have done in my career is slow the rate at which things are getting worse. And when it comes down to it, that's all we've been able to do. We've made things a little bit less worse. We haven't made it, we haven't really started to improve things. Uh, 150 to 200 species go extinct every single day. According to the most recent U.S. Geological Survey, Every river and stream in the United States is contaminated with carcinogens, 40% of them to the point where they no longer support life. Every mother's breast milk is contaminated with dioxin, one of the most dangerous chemicals known to science. 90% of the large fish in the ocean are dead. 98% of, of native forests, 97% of native grasslands. Migratory songbird populations are collapsing. Mollusk populations are collapsing, amphibian populations, fish populations. Human languages and cultures are disappearing at an even faster average rate. And now, even the most conservative predictions of climate change are issuing dire, dire warning for our future. Some are predicting that by the end of the century, the Earth could be 11 degrees warmer in average temperature. And the last time the Earth was that warm, there were alligators swimming in the Hudson Bay. So the question becomes, what are the implications? What does it really mean if we take all this to heart and take an honest look at where we're at, especially in relation to the efforts of mainstream modern environmentalism? Well, a place to start is with an understanding that tangible, lasting, pervasive change will really only come when people start to question the system itself. It's when the participants in this real-life Milgram experiment begin to question the dictates of the men in the white lab coats that we start to see a chance for change. Now, to question an entire system is to question a social structure based on industrialism and extraction that will always be arranged for the benefit of one party at the expense of another. This way of relating to the rest of the world requires that we bury empathy, obscure communication, and distort morality. To put this another way, we've sacrificed everything that once made us human in the name of that single god, progress. Now, I just mentioned um, a series of experiments called the Milgram Experiments. I don't know um, if, if folks have heard about that, but it's a really important way to look at the situation that we face and more importantly, the reaction to the situation that we face. 
Um, so the Milgram experiments were a series of tests run in the 1950s by a guy named Stanley Milgram at uh, Yale University. And uh, what Milgram did is he put out a call for a memory test, brought in subjects, um, and then sat these subjects down in a room, uh, and then put actors in another room, and the two were connected via microphones and speakers. And then the subject, the person that they brought in off the street, asked the actor questions. And whenever the actor got a question wrong, that subject was told to uh, hit a little button and give them an electric shock. And they were given increasing amounts of electrocution uh, as they got more and more questions wrong, until eventually there was a level labeled lethal dose. And so the actor would, would you know, grunt, yell, scream in pain, and then eventually fall silent. Now, the thing driving this experiment, when, when these subjects ask, you know, what was going on, why do I have to keep doing this, I don't want to keep doing this, there were signs of severe stress in these subjects, but they were told to keep going by, you know, official looking men with white lab coats and clipboards who were supposed to be the controllers of this experiment. Um, so they were told to keep going all the way up to that lethal dose. Experts, psychologists in the field, they predicted that only a minuscule percentage of people were going to actually go all the way up to the lethal dose. And then they were astounded to find out that a vast majority of people, when they were told by this authority figure to apply this lethal dose of electrocution, they did it. Uh, so most people are going to follow authority. They're going to walk blindly to the ends of the earth, as long as the men in the white lab coats tell them it's for the best. But there is no shot to all of this. Some of these participants, they resisted. They said no. They stood up for what they believed in. And they chose to ignore the commands of those controlling the experiment. Now, we're talking about winning and losing. And we're talking about questioning the underlying premises of an entire system. So that brings up an implication of sides. One side that's going to win, and one side that's going to lose. Like a labor organizer and folk singer Utah Phillips said, uh, the planet isn't dying, she's being killed, and the people who are doing it have names and addresses. So which side are you on? At this stage in the struggle, there's a clear line in the sand. You're either with the living world, and by extension every living being who calls her home, or you're against her. Then once you've decided which side of this line you stand on, the next question is, who stands opposite you? I hope by now it's clear to you which side of that line we stand on at DGR. Um, and as those who seek to protect a living, a thriving, replenished, healthy world for future generations, we've identified human civilization as our enemy in this struggle. To take this a bit further, we apply Derek Jensen's definition of civilization, uh, which I feel provides a really great analytical tool for understanding this situation. Um, so Jensen defines, a, uh, a, defines civilization as a way of life characterized by the growth of cities. So then the question becomes, okay, what's a city? Well, a city is a number, a high enough, a large enough, large enough number of people living on one piece of land to the to the extent that they've denuded their land base of the resources they need to survive. So in other words, it's people living in place and they can no longer support themselves with the land off the land that they live on. So they have to get resources from elsewhere. They have to go and take it from usually other people, certainly other non humans <coughs> Now, this organization, this civilization, started about 10,000 years ago, um, really only representing like a minuscule fraction of human existence on this planet. Uh, and it started in a place we still ironically call the Fertile Crescent, which is not so fertile anymore. Um, the present-day Middle East, Iraq, Iran, um, around the Mediterranean, where, you know, hot, dry desert. Not a whole lot grown there anymore. Uh, and at this point, a group of hunter-gatherers uh, began to practice a new subsistence method that led to an increase in the cultural, in the cultural complexity. Pulitzer Prize-winning author Jared Diamond called this the worst mistake in the history of the human race. 
then this onrushing tide of civilization proceeded outward, and it's been going ever since. Now, it's essential to understand that the beginnings of civilization was the beginnings of deforestation and species loss. It was the beginning of hierarchical social structures with kings, nobles, and priests dominating the lower classes who couldn't control the food that they produced. It was the beginning of both standing armies and slavery with, uh, with soldiers controlling the slaves and then the slaves providing the labor so that they could then in turn provide the material support for the soldiers. It was the beginning of patriarchy, it was the beginning of monotheism, it was the beginning of the nation state, and eventually the beginnings of industrial capitalism. This increased cultural complexity spawned a way of life predicated on forced enslavement and violence. That's what we see around us today. As Oscar Wilde said, the fact is civilization requires slaves. And today there are more slaves in the world than there were at the height of the mid-Atlantic slave trade. Now this point cannot be understated. A mode of living based on the growth of cities can be neither equitable nor sustainable. It never was and it never will be. And like empires, which can be seen as a microcosm of this civilization, the exponential expansion can't go on forever. It can't last. And we're now beginning to see cracks in this facade. The unfortunate truth behind that is that these cracks have the potential to widen into a chasm large enough to suck the whole world down with it. We're currently in the midst of the largest mass extinction that the world has seen in 65 million years. It's called the Holocene Extinction Event, or alternately, the Anthropocene Extinction Event, which Anthropocene means it's caused by human activity. This population growth, this urban sprawl, an economic arrangement preaching infinite growth on a finite planet, the felling of forests and the plowing of fields for thousands of years of agriculture, the human meddling with biological processes developed over millions of years, all of these present day hallmarks of civilizations, if they go unchecked, spell doom for our planet. All of this is to say that uh, DGR, the group that we're with, is about fighting back putting everything on the line, because at this point, we have nothing left. We are a membership organization, and we operate on a decentral, on a modified, um, decentralized structure. So what that means is that we have local groups that are wholly autonomous, as long as they operate within a statement of principles and a code of conduct, which we have up here on the table if you're interested. Um, we were inspired by, clearly, a book of the same name. And if you're interested, we have the book for sale. Um, they also have the book for sale here at Coop Buzzard, and it sounds like there's a great deal on it. Um, <clears throat> we also have this strategy up here in pamphlet form, and it's also for free online. And uh, Val's going to talk a little bit more about what that strategy looks like. But we're not here today to talk specifically about DGR. We are here, however, to talk about fighting back and more importantly, a necessary aspect to that struggle overlooked by many mainstream and radical environmental groups. Now, for indigenous people living in North America who uh, once lived free of dependency on fossil fuels before colonization, the wholesale destruction of life and lands to feed a way of life that is inherently unsustainable is downright insane. Yet, because this colonizing society has systematically attacked indigenous ways of being and made living traditionally increasingly more difficult, indigenous peoples are fighting with civilization's 21st century paradigm. The same paradigm we're all fit, we're all fighting, because we're all part of it. We're all part of this fossil fuel economy. Hence, we share a responsibility to bring this insanity to men. So, in short, tonight, we're here to stand with indigenous peoples. Indigenous folks who are taking a stand in defense of their land and in defense of life. Recognizing the interconnectedness of all life, most indigenous people understand that civilized humans cannot continue to destroy the earth and expect to live. It's insane, again. Increasingly, we live in an age when we need to mobilize across cultural lines and we need to stand in solidarity with all land defenders if we hope to succeed in this struggle. 
In the Wet'suwet'en territory in British Columbia, the land defenders are not attempting to save their lands only to have companies and governments cast their eyes on some other indigenous land for exploitation. They seek to stop the exploitation and rape of all indigenous lands. The hosts of the Unistoten Action Camp that we're going up to have written, quote, our communities and nations are at the forefront of land defense against resource extraction, oil and gas development, mining projects, and corporate theft. These colonial developments have had a devastating impact on our water, our salmon, our food base, our spiritual sites, our cultural well-being, our traditional livelihoods, our children, and our future generations but we have been resisting since time immemorial, and by uniting our resistance, we are stronger. Everywhere indigenous peoples still exist, they are fighting for the right to continue to do so. Now through the course of our lives, members of this culture, members of the settler culture, the one we're all part of, are encouraged to think that colonization was a thing of the past, that we now live in harmony with our indigenous neighbors, this, frankly, is a lie. On the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, which has one of the lowest life expectancies on this continent, the Oglala Lakota Nation is fighting a genocidal liquor industry in a town called White Clay, just over the border. These four liquor stores in a town of 14 people violate treaties and are responsible for sexual violence, violent crime, and deaths every month. In Brazil, Authority, authorities from the Jaruna and Arara Nation have detained oil company executives, I'm sorry, they're just officials, unfortunately not the executives, in protest of the Belmonte Dam, which will be one of the largest hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams on the planet and is devastating tribal lands. 300 indigenous protesters occupied and destroyed the initial foundations of this dam last month, prompting the governments to intervene and to offer concessions which aren't being met. In California, a tribe called the Winnemum Wintu had to fight tooth and nail to keep weekend boaters from driving through and interrupting their tribal ceremony, which has been occurring in the same place for thousands of years. In Arizona, the Diné people of Black Mesa are, have been fighting genocidal relocation for over 30 years. The government wants them out of the way so that they can get their coal and so that they can get the water that's on the, their traditional lands. In British Columbia, there are more indigenous children in foster care now than there were being stolen at the height of the resident school program. In Nigeria, a militant indigenous group called MEND, the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta, has reduced oil output from that country by 30%. And during a se one series of attacks, they reduced it by 80. These people have told Shelby, leave our lands or die in them. In 2010, the Canadian government imposed a banned council system on the Algonquins of Barriar Lake, which is about four hours north of Montreal. Just this summer, that banned council has cooperated with the government in allowing the clear cutting of traditional lands. This in spite of the, of, of the opposition of the people, from the people in the tribe. Then there's the fight against the tar sands, which Max is going to talk about here in a moment. Now, that's just a brief survey. That's just a sampling of indigenous threats and the corresponding resistance. This isn't a mistake. Genocide is not an exception in the sweeping expansion of civilization. It is civilization. The civilization is not only based on, but it necessitates exploitation, domination, devastation, and violation. Indigenous author Jack Forbes calls this insanity that drives civilized humans to destroy ourselves, a disease, a disease akin to cannibalism. He uses the term huitico to describe this disease of cannibalism, and then he defines a cannibal as an evil spirit or person who terrorizes other creatures by means of evil acts, including the consumption of another's flesh. The overriding character of the cannibal is this consumption. That is, the cannibal is a predator. This predation 
in turn is disguised by many of the abstract principles that we take for granted. Things like patriotism, things like the free market, production, piety, career advancement. The fact is, colonization creates cannibals, it breeds them. The colonizer looks to plant this disease of cannibalism among populations he hopes to dominate. This is necessary. It makes colonization seem desirable to these populations. This, in turn, keeps the targeted population divided and helpless. The colonizer propagates ideas of racial superiority, making the targets feel as though colonization is inevitable. And thus, in many instances, this fight is over before any blood can need be shed. In describing the US, the US policy um, against indigenous peoples standing between the settlements of the East and the resources of the West, Thomas Jefferson said, quote, it is two measures are deemed expedient. First, to encourage them to abandon hunting, and second, to multiply trading houses among them, leading them thus to agriculture, to manufactures, to civilization. This inserting of civilized institutions between native peoples and their connection with the land is a means of subordination to the ends of the world. This is an essential front in the war against exploitation and violation, and it is long past time for members of the settler culture who want to see this culture stopped to put our bodies on the line. This is not an attempt to idealize or trivialize indigenous peoples or indigenous ways of being. This is to state the simple fact that this fight that we wage is a fight that indigenous nations have been fighting from their respective first contacts with the colonizing culture. This coupled with the fact that indigenous peoples across the globe have been able to live sustainably in one place for thousands upon thousands of years. This way of life, this civilization that has unfolded over 10,000 years of genocidal occupation illegitimate claims to moral righteousness, and governments that serve to expedite the flow of wealth into the hands of the few. And this has been 10,000 years of slavery, militarization, deprivation, and marginalization. And this way of life is killing the planet. It's killing everything you love. And it's high time we stand with allies who understand the enemy and understand sustainability far more than anyone who is the product of this civilization. Now, I believe someone's going to play some music for us. Jeremy. Awesome. We're going to just <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you know, Jeremy's going to play a couple songs and then I'm going to speak. And then hopefully we'll have a couple more albums and then we'll have a And then we'll have a discussion. exciting things I've played at in, in a really long time. Um, I started reading Derek Jensen back in 2002, uh, Language Older Than Words, and uh, I was living in Portland, and I was very blown away uh, by the experiences that he went through in the book and how he uh, relates that to civilization. Um, I was very inspired to, to write a song which I I labeled my, or titled my fourth record. It's called In the Hour of Our Lords. And it pretty much, <coughs> everything that Xander just said is pretty much uh, what this is about. Um, we are, as a civilization, unfortunately, uh, praising things that destroy us. So uh, this, is, this is that song. And thank you so much for listening.
mother it seems Falling ill in the teens Giving pills, regimen Heal the cancer, it's our own It's worrying the mass As they hide behind the glass Losing shape and turning backs In the hour of our lords We Master is our own. He was made with human hands. Now he kills and makes demands of our mother all alone. The Savior is not mine. He appears in time and time. Not from nature, but from minds. In the hour of our Lord. After the end, no more reason for pretend. I'll now bend in knees to send the hour of our Lord. Thank you very much to be able to perform that at this event. Is that it means a lot to me because it was written for the people that do this. So. Um, the next song I'm going to do is, uh, is very inspired by the, the tar sands and, uh, and just the, the decimation of apex predators um, around the world. And I just learned a really horrible fact the other night that uh, the lion population in the last 50 years has gone from 450,000 to just under 20,000. In 50 years, that's really, it's, it's devastating. Uh, and it's, it doesn't stop there. It's just one after another, um, bears and wolves. Uh, around the world. So we need to do something. Uh, and this is what I'm doing, I guess. And it's called, um, this is called What Gun Shoots Your Personality. This is not a song that I get to perform very often, so uh, hopefully I do an okay job. Poison kills, they 
fair share of course cattle feed my kind and I'll kill before they feed theirs I'll kill another one I'm a brave animal all for the love of sport I'm a brave I'll read the earth of all Save one Save I'm Tribes are no longer No balance in nature can be found The human won't allow For another one there I'll kill another one, I'm a brave animal All for the love of sport, I'm a brave animal No more competition, I'm a brave animal I'll rid the earth of all Thank you guys very much. I would love to keep in touch with folks that are like-minded um, songwriters who have uh, songs such as my own. Uh, a lot of times cannot find venues that will allow us to do this kind of thing. So if you also do this kind of thing, um, or you know a venue that enjoys it, just like feel here, um, this is a great space for that uh, this kind of music. So I just want to say thank you so much. I have CDs. Um, if you're interested, I'm just giving most of it actually to the Deep Green Resistance. So if you can buy it from me, you're actually giving it to them. So let's keep in touch. What's your name? My name is Jeremy Serward. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming here. My name is Max. I'm an organizer with Deep Green Resistance. And uh, so we're on tour right now. Uh, this is our, what, uh, fourth, fifth, fifth city we've stopped in so far. Um, probably talked to maybe, what, 100, 100 people or more so far. Um, so the main reason that we're that we're doing this, the main reason that we're here is to stand in solidarity with uh, a few clans of the Wet'suwet'en and First Nation in Central British Columbia. And I've been thinking lately about the the idea of what it means to be indigenous to a place. And obviously, I'm not indigenous, so I, I can't fully know. But from my conversations with indigenous folks and my reading, uh, I think part of what it means is that you've lived in place for long enough that you know how to live in balance. And so the Wet'suwet'en are indigenous to the place where they live. And, and so I think part of that, what that means is that like Douglas firs and like Chinook salmon and like tiger salamanders who also live in this place, they know how to live there in balance in a good way. Um, but that balance, you know, has been under threat for a long time now since colonization. And the latest, uh, the latest way this threat has manifested is uh, through a series of pipelines that uh, a group of oil corporations wants to put through. 
um, from the interior of Alberta and BC out to the coast. Um, and the first one uh, is a natural gas pipeline. Uh, three main companies are involved. In Canna Corporation, EOG Resources, which uh, formerly known as Enron Oil and Gas, um, and the third one is Apache Corporation. And collectively, those three corporations are probably worth $50 billion or so. Uh, so it gives you just a little idea of the sort of resources that we're up against. Um, so the first pipeline is actually going to be a natural gas pipeline. Uh, and of course, much of this natural gas is extracted through the new process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Um, and that's where they you know, take superheated uh, toxic slurry of chemicals, they inject it into the ground at high pressure, and it shatters the rock, and then they can extract the natural gas. Um, probably could have no impact on groundwater quality or anything like that, so don't be worried. <laughs> um, another good note is that uh, Incana Corporation was named one of the 100 most sustainable corporations in the world by Corporate Nights Magazine. Yeah. Um, how many people read Corporate Nights? So. <laughs> uh, but, uh, another good study in that pipe, in that magazine showed that um, in Alberta, um, in what was it, 2010, there were only 18 pipeline ruptures in Alberta. Only 18. So they're getting pretty reliable. They only spilled 900,000 gallons of oil. So uh, I don't know what to make of that. Um, did you know oil companies no longer use the term spill? They call them releases now. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's how the PR people earn their money. Uh, so between 1990 and 2005 in Alberta, there were 16,000 releases. Um, 16,000. Uh, so this first pipeline, they're calling it the Trailblazer. <laughs> and it would bring natural gas in. And the, the name is, is, is apt, it's descriptive, because they're actually going to put in nine pipelines eventually uh, through this right of way. And so the trailblazer, you know, they're going to chop the forest and clear the wetland, and all the other pipelines are going to follow the same path. Can, can you just tell me from where to where are these pipelines going? Um, they're basically going across the center of British Columbia mm -hmm. out to the coast. Um, so like midway between Southeast Alaska and Washington State. Um, we've got a map somewhere, I don't know if one of you can find that somewhere, but we can pull it out later. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're starting in like Northeast British Columbia and mm -hmm. uh, Central Alberta. Mm -hmm. So how many miles is that? It's about 900 miles long, I think. Um, so the most famous one that they're going to put in is called the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Mm -hmm. And um, that's going to be the one that runs from the tar sands out to the coast. And the tar sands are in central Alberta. Um, can anyone here just briefly, does anyone know the difference between uh, tar sands oil and regular oil? I know they don't teach this stuff, but... Thicker. Thicker, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not actually liquid oil. What you find, find in the ground at the tar sands is it's tar. They call it bitumen. It's like a sticky, you know, tarry substance that's mixed in with sand and all kinds of other materials in the ground. Um, and so um, it's the stuff that would become liquid oil if it were sitting in the ground for another few million years. So they have to artificially go through the process of making it liquid oil that you could put in your car or something like that. Um, so there are two main ways that it's extracted, and the first is just brute force. So they just clear all the forests, they bulldoze the wetlands, they rip up the grasslands, and then they bring in massive trucks, three stories tall, and here's a map so we can take a look. Yeah. So exhibit A here. So this is the tar sand spider web. Um, so the tar sands are right up here in central Alberta, it's kind of just north of Montana. Um, and here we are, there's already a pipeline that runs from the Alberta tar sands 
to a couple of refineries in Washington. So the uh, purple is existing major pipelines. Um, the red lines are proposed major pipeline expansions. And the green are entirely new pipelines that are proposed. So the one that we're talking about are the, the two, are marked on here as two, are going right here out to central DC there. Um, so the strip mining, that's the first way that they extract it. And you know, some of these trucks, you know, they burn 100 gallons of diesel in an hour, um, which is kind of an important point because even at an economic level, the tar sands are pretty crazy. Back in the day in Pennsylvania, when they first started drilling for oil, basically, you know, you poke a hole in the ground and it came gushing out in a geyser. They called them gushers. And so you had to put in very little energy and you get tons of energy out. But nowadays, uh, you know, all that easy stuff is gone. And that's why they're going to deep water drilling. That's why they're going to the tar sands. These methods are way more expensive and much less profitable for them. Um, and eventually it's going to get to a point where it actually costs more energy to get the oil out than the oil has in, in energy. Um, and that's, you know, that's the point when it's no longer economically feasible at all. Um, so it's kind of like growing food. Um, you know, if you're plowing a field and you're working a field, and the work is so exhausting and backbreaking that you can't actually grow enough food to support yourself and your hunger, your ravenous hunger, then the only way that you can do it are, is through slavery or through fossil fuels. And that's pretty much the history of human civilization right there, um, the last 10,000 years. Um, so we're kind of down to the bottom of the barrel. Um, so anyway, back to the tar sands. The second way they extract it is called in situ, which means uh, the land is left intact. Uh, those PR people again. Um, so this technique is kind of similar to hydraulic fracking. Uh, they drill holes in the ground. They inject superheated steam, and it kind of liquefies the bitumen, and then they can suck it out. So the first method, the strip mining, just leaves nothing. It just leaves open pits in the ground. This method, it leaves uh, the ghost of a forest. Uh, there's you know, pipelines crisscrossing it, access roads, toxic spills. Um, there's essentially no wildlife. Um, so after it's been extracted, it has to be refined. It has to be upgraded. Um, so the first thing they do is they wash it. They take massive quantities of water to wash away the impurities and the heavy metals and all the sand and the material that's mixed in. And it takes about five gallons of water to produce one gallon of oil at the tar sands. Uh, so the last time I checked the numbers, which was about four years ago, they were pulling 10% of the water flow of the entire Athabasca River, which is the most important wetland in the world for migratory birds, or sorry, not in the world, in North America, for migratory birds headed up to the Arctic, 10%. And the production has gone up quite a bit since then, so I'm sure they're using more. Um, so this water is left as this toxic sludge, essentially. It's full of arsenic and benzenes and nasty stuff. Um, so they've got a great way of getting rid of it. They dig a hole in the ground, and then they dump it in. <laughs> uh, pretty high tech. Uh, they don't really bother with lining these holes with anything or uh, really any safety precautions whatsoever. So they're leaching into the groundwater. Um, birds who land in these ponds tend to just be dead within like a few minutes of landing. Um, so like I said, uh, there are two refineries in Washington state that process tar sands oil. Uh, one just outside Anacortes. Uh, adjacent to the Swinomish Reservation, and one just outside Bellingham, adjacent to the Lummi Reservation. Um, and both of these are indigenous communities that are being told, don't eat your traditional foods. They're not healthy. They're full of heavy metals. Um, don't eat the fish. Don't eat the shellfish. Um, and that's, that's the destruction of a culture. That's the destruction of a way of life. That's the definition of genocide right there. Um, 
And it, it reminds me of a story that our friend Waz uh, told me, and she couldn't be here tonight, but she lives on a small reservation in Minnesota, and there is one man in her tribe who goes out fishing on the river every day. And there is a coal power plant upstream, so the river is extremely toxified, mercury and all kinds of stuff. Um, and this man gets the fish, and he feeds them himself, he feeds them to his family, and, uh, and people ask him, why do, you, why do you do it? This is crazy, you're poisoning yourself. And he says, I'm indigenous to this place. And what that means is you can't separate me from the river. If the river is sick, then I'm sick. And to me, that kind of, I think, is a big part of what it means to be indigenous to a place, is that you can't be separated from the land there. Um, so the tar sands is really growing like crazy. There are new leases, uh, new areas of, that they're leasing off all the time, and it's projected to devastate an area the size of Florida in the end, um, about the size of the UK. Um, so the economic interests, you know, are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, the Canadian government has bowed down to all of them. Uh, the US government has been very complicit in it. And actually, a lot of the tar sands work is at the behest of the US, because because of the free trade agreements, NAFTA and others, uh, the US gets first dibs on all the oil that's extracted from the tar sands. Mm -hmm. So it's not even benefiting the people of Canada that much. Uh, are, are all those U.S. companies, the three you named, are those uh, U.S.? I believe two of those are based in Houston, uh -huh. and one of them is based in Calgary. Mm -hmm. um, but the tar sands, there are companies in there from China, mm -hmm. Norway, mm -hmm. all over the world, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so the tar sands, of course, mostly benefits rich people. You know, they're making an obscene amount of money off this. Um, it's kind of like a capitalist dream. Uh, an entry-level truck driver can go up there and make $100,000 easy. Um, the culture in these Canadian boom towns uh, out in the bush where the tar sands are, it's been described as being like the Wild West. Uh, it's essentially you know, hard drugs, uh, alcoholism, prostitution. And you know the costs can be measured in you know the rising numbers of overdoses and traffic deaths and missing women. Um, and many of the workers are immigrants, actually, who are brought in on these restrictive work contracts. They're told that they're going to get citizenship and that they're going to uh, get to live in Canada and enjoy the benefits of first world privilege. But um, when their contracts end, they're they're told that they're not going to get citizenship, and then they're shipped out, and often they have to pay their own plane tickets home from their, their hard-earned money that they made up. Um, so the impacts on the First Nations people in this area are pretty bad, and especially because it's pretty remote country. And a lot of these folks are fishing, hunting, and gathering their food. That's what they do. That's what they've done. They, haven't, they never stopped. Um, so now, you know, they'll pull a fish out of the river and it will have no eyes, or it will have tumors, or they'll cut open a moose and the liver will be so full of heavy metals that you can smell it when you cut, cut the body open. Um, <coughs> rare forms of cancer are just not rare anymore in these communities. And of course, the Canadian government has, you know, uh, basically tried to bottle up all the health studies that are showing this. Um, they really need to maintain the illusion that they're upstanding citizens and that they're trying to avoid this really unpleasant reality, which is that they're profiting from murder and they're getting away with it at this point. Um, so this has been a lot of heavy stuff and you know, with good reason, the tar sands are considered the most destructive industrial project in the world and in human history. Um, you know, they're trying to put in all those pipelines that you saw on the map. But the good news is that the this kind of falling off. <laughs> the good news is that uh, the fight is kind of heating up. 
Um, some friends of ours are down in Texas right now, um, and they're organizing a blockade of the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline, which is the huge one that you've probably heard about. Uh, some folks on the Pine Ridge Reservation, some indigenous folks, um, organized by one of TR's buddies out there. Uh, they did a blockade of some parts headed for that pipeline earlier this year. And just to give you an idea of the dedication that we're seeing in indigenous communities fighting against extraction and civilization, some of the people doing the blockade were in their 90s. Um, so that's humbling. Uh, and of course, these corporations all work together. You know, these are multinational conglomerates. The, they often have stock in all kinds of other companies. They're all really interlinked. And really, it's you know, what is it? It's a legal fiction that provides this veil between the people who are profiting, making billions and billions of dollars, and the people who are getting killed. And it's hard to break through that legal veil. Um, one method that some friends of ours have been using. <coughs> Uh, effectively so far is from this group called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, CELDIF, and they're organizing in Bellingham right now. Um, they've been organizing in Spokane. Most of their work has been in rural conservative communities in Pennsylvania and the Northeast. Um, but their model is they go into a community and they organize around a specific issue. You know, a factory farm, a mine, a oil pipeline, natural gas fracking, whatever, you know, big box store, whatever it is. And they pass a local law that not only bans the project, but it revokes corporate rights. So within that municipality, you know, no more free speech, no more limited liability, none of that stuff. And then it also gives rights to nature. So it's kind of similar to the model used in the civil rights movement, where you know they were trying to get rights and get the rights of personhood for people of color. And this is the same for nature. So in these communities, I, Max Wilbur, could go sue Walmart on behalf of the wetland that they want to destroy. Um, and that wetland would have the same standing as the person. I guess it wouldn't be a person no longer in these communities. It would be. It would be the actual people who own the corporation who would be liable. Um, so it's a pretty cool model. Um, what are they called again? They're called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, CELDF. And it's just CELDF.org. And there's a Seattle uh, initiative we're trying to get signatures for that is modeled on their model. I yeah, 103 and the petition is at the front door. Yeah, I saw that actually. Yeah. I didn't know that was there. Yeah, it's yeah. Really that's great. a CELDF model. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So they're they're working really hard, and their latest uh, idea. We were just on the phone with them the other week. Their latest idea is to uh, take it to the next step and add to the law something that says uh, this community now has the authority <laughs> to use civil disobedience to enforce the law. So if you know they try and send the coal train through and Bellingham has you know passed this law, then the Bellingham police would would wouldn't go get the protesters off the tracks. They would, you know, they would protect them, essentially, um, ideally. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty cool model because it, you know, it redistributes power. It's not, it, it redefines power. It's not just tinkering around the edges of the system. Um, and they actually went down to Ecuador and helped get uh, rights for nature written into the Ecuadorian constitution. So that's pretty cool. Is there a, is there a legal basis for it? Um, essentially, they go back to a lot of the original constitutional stuff um, about community self-determination and community right to govern. Um, so when they go into these communities, under the law as it is now, a community has no right to say no to a project like an oil pipeline coming through. Like 100% of the people in Bellingham could say, we do not want coal trains coming through our town. And because of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, they have no right to do anything about it whatsoever. The corporations' rights trump the people's rights every time. Um, and uh, so essentially it's, a, it's an assertion of self-determination. Um, and the idea is they're under no illusions that 
the, gov the federal government isn't just going to sue them because the federal government is going to. But that's actually the conflict that they want to force because it shows how much of a sham this democracy is and how there actually is no community self-determination. There is no democracy. There is no representation. Um, you know, Bellingham has seven uh, people on the city council. They're all, you know, they're all pretty liberal. It's a very progressive um, city council. And they said, you know, we don't want this coal train to come through, but uh, we have we can't do anything about it. I mean, the, the government players have have no leeway essentially within the, the rules as they're structured. Um, so you know, this progressive city council that individually none of them actually want the coal train, they sued the, the organizers in Bellingham who are trying to do this ordinance to to, to, to try and stop it going to the ballot. Uh, and that, that's in court right now, and it's the, the organizers are probably going to win. Well, the city of Bellingham, but the city council instructed them to do so. Yeah. So anyway, Selva is a pretty cool model. So I urge you all to look into them. Um, so back to the pipeline here. Um, after going through some of the last impact ancient forest on the west coast. Uh, there are some pictures right here of the area. Yeah. There's an idea of the forest that this uh, pipeline would be going through. Um, it would be loaded into tankers that are 10 times the size of the Exxon Valdez uh, tanker, uh, which would then have to navigate through a uh, series of narrow waterways, valleys, reefs. Um, it's an area that's not even safe for small boats. There was a, a ferry boat that struck a reef there and sank uh, in 2006, I believe. Two people died. Uh, and these tankers would be going past those same rocks 225 times a year. Um, so that can't be dangerous at all. Uh, so this area is called the Great Bear Rainforest, um, and it's one of the last places in the world where you have a wild forest and a wild ocean meeting each other. And it's a place where the wolves eat the salmon, the bears eat the salmon, the whales eat the salmon, the trees eat the salmon. Um, There's salmon left? Yes, they're healthy salmon runs. Um, it's the only place in the world that's home to the spirit bear, uh, which is a, that's not a polar bear, it's actually a black bear that has a genetic trait that causes it to have a white, white fur. Um, and they're not albinos, they're actually, they just have white fur. Um, and there's estimated to be 200 of them left. Uh, they're sacred to the First Nations. Um, and the only reason they're still around at all is because they were kept secret for 200 years from the fur traders and the trappers um, who probably would have taken them all as quickly as they could. Um, so I want to read a short quote from a uh, fellow Danny Danes from the Gitgot First Nation, which is on the coast uh, a little further west of where we'll be. And he says, the ocean here is like a fridge to us native people. If we want something to eat, we hop on a boat and we go out and we get it. That ferry sinking, to me, was a warning. So that, to me, kind of gets uh, to the essence of how this culture consumes. Because if I could go out and get go out on a boat and get salmon and get crabs and get halibut and get all my food, then I sure as hell wouldn't you know, go work my crappy job and go down to the grocery store if I could be out in a beautiful rainforest and surviving off what the land gives willingly. Um, so, you know, really, it's not a question of if a spill would happen, but when a spill would happen in this place. And then, you know, that's the end of the salmon, it's the end of the bears, uh, it's the end of the way of life of the First Nations there. Um, these tankers are so huge that an oil spill uh, could spread a slick from Juneau to Seattle. Um, so where we're going, uh, it's the, it's the Unistoten Action Camp. Um, 
And the organizers of this camp, they needed to stop this pipeline. And they literally said, this will only go through over our dead bodies. Um, and so they're asking for help, and they're very serious. So the camp is located along the Maurice River, and it's a strategic choke point. Uh, the pipeline has to go through there. So if they can build the whole rest of the pipeline, but if they can't build this one section, that oil is not going to flow. Um, so they've set up blockades, they've set up cabins, they've set up gardens. They've been there for three years, um, and the pipeline construction is supposed to start in about a week, uh, a week and a half. And um, that's why they're having the third annual gathering up there. Uh, it starts on August 6th. And we'll be taking part in trainings, uh, sharing stories, um, taking part in workshops, building their defenses, bringing supplies, bringing food, bringing money, bringing uh, camping gear, and all sorts of useful stuff. Um, and we're going to stand with these people. Um, and they need our support. They need words of support. They need material support. They need everything we can give. So uh, I think Mads is going to play here in a minute, but I just want to read uh, a short quote from the organizers of the camp. Uh, so just to preface this, uh, they use the term NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, NIMBY. Um, and that basically is referring to people who only will fight a project like this when it's coming through their area. Um, so, you know, as long as it's out of sight, out of mind, other people are getting sick, other streams are getting destroyed, then they won't worry about it. So, this is their statement. The grassroots Wet'suwet'en will stop all pipelines by any means necessary. In solidarity with nations also opposing pipelines in their territories, we do not take any needy approaches in our strong stance against poisoning waters for money and greed. We stand beside communities in all directions, taking action to stop the pipelines. So if I want to get through one thing from my whole talk, it's just that we need to fight with the same urgency that these people are showing. Because uh, in the end, you know, it's, it's all life that's on the line. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, and I think Mads is going to play a couple yeah. songs. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Um, and then Val will finish us off. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's uh, Mads Jacobson, and I missed the talk. Um, so I'm kind of friends with TR. We're friends, you know, I just met him. And um, I'm just going to play a few songs you guys don't have to listen. <laughs> um, yeah, I missed the talk, but like, my opinion is basically until we abolish the government, we can't save the earth. Can resist as much as we want, but as long as the government's here, we're just going to be arrested and put in cells. And there's not enough of us to really uh, stop civilization yet, I think. That's my opinion. We have to, I'm an anarchist. But I'm for like direct action. I just think we need a mass movement that challenges. I think man made laws can't solve these problems. I got things. <laughs> Um, like I have a question. What's the point in um, like legalizing like civil disobedience or waiting for it to be passed as a law? Because shouldn't we just do what we know is right without it being a law? Um, for inviting me.
how'd that blockade go? Like, yeah, that your friend was a part of? Um, you mean the one in White Clay? Yeah, like a year ago or something? I don't, I don't remember. The yeah. Elder Stout, the Alex White Clay one? Did it, like, work? Or? Um, it worked for a while, but it actually the, the tribal police ended up as ex ex Oh, they took the trucks and escorted them through tribal land and then off. Mm -hmm. Four five got arrested in the process because they wouldn't leave the road, so that's what happened.
one's like half mine and half someone else's. Power, 
the very few people who are benefiting from the devastation of so many, they're not going to give up their power with a kind request. The powerful are unmoved by compliance symbolic actions, and they're going to continue poisoning our air, our water, and our soil, no matter how many petitions are signed. In this indigenous struggle, I see a dedication and a loyalty to the natural world that's unparalleled in the modern environmental movement. As comfortably privileged environmentalists congratulate each other on the purchase of a get hip, go green coffee mug, there are people out there putting their lives on the line for the preservation of the natural world. So as a comfortably privileged environmentalist myself, it's necessary for me to learn from and promote these facets of indigenous struggle and incorporate them into the work that I do in solidarity. I have to understand that I can't just ask nicely for things to change, and I have to commit myself to the preservation of the land. So these goals are what brought me to support a strategy called the Decisive Ecological Warfare. It's written by Lear Keith, Eric McBay, and Derek Jensen, because it, propo it proposes effective action centered around these ideas. So the most significant aspect of Decisive Ecological Warfare, or the DEW strategy, is that it's made up of two distinct and very separate kinds of resistors, above ground and underground. So the above ground is made up of people who resist within the tightening limits of state repression. They engage in things like education, building sustainable communities, outreach and public speaking. So under those criteria, you can tell that I'm an above ground organizer here speaking with you here today. But another vital part of the work that I and my fellow above ground organizers do is taking part in direct action in the form of nonviolent civil disobedience, which is what we're on our way up to join the Una Stoughton clan in doing. And these above ground direct actions can still be done with only relatively minor repercussions from the state, for now anyways. And these risks are some that we have to take to bring awareness to issues, to shut down an extraction site even for just one day, to make sure that the powerful know that we're here and we're not just going to sit by and watch what we love be killed. Direct action is something that cannot be forgotten in the work of those who are above ground. Those who are the public faces of the struggle for life. But there's still a burning question that we have to ask. Is it enough? If we acknowledge that we can't just ask kindly for change, and we must have unquestioning loyalty to the living beings who continue to suffer. Can I be satisfied with just this kind of action? And the answer that I found for this question is what makes up another essential task of an above ground organizer, which is to publicly advocate underground resistance. Underground resistors would work outside of the realm of what state repression allows. It's easy for me to guess why it's not allowed. Underground resistance would look like sabotage, so physical dismantling of destructive infrastructure, even the spreading of suppressed or sensitive information is underground work. Historically, we can see that this two-sided approach is what makes so many resistance movements effective. But only one side of the story is talked about and so much of the resistance that we know the most about. Some of the suffragettes in the UK protested very effectively, but some of them were burning down the houses of politicians that opposed women's right to vote. Martin Luther King Jr. advocated only nonviolence, but there was also Malcolm X, who pushed the civil rights movement a step further with his militancy. Gandhi became the figurehead for pacifism, but his dialogue with British colonizers was only possible through the diversity of tactics of another Indian revolutionary, Bhagat Singh. The African National Congress in South Africa, they called for strikes, boycotts, defiance against apartheid, but their leadership also recognized the necessity for a military wing of the very same party called Mkonto Wei Sizwe, or the Spear of the Nation. Underground action isn't allowed because it can create material change. And that's a really scary thought for those who are profiting from the way things are. So to make it very clear, we need an organized underground movement with the strength and strategic savvy to pull off decisive attacks on industrial infrastructure on a continental scale. We needed this yesterday. It's long past time for such a movement. 150 to 200 species went extinct today. It's too late for them. The reason they teach attacks on, attacks on infrastructure at military academies and officer training is because it's very, very effective. So with these two kinds of resistance working in their own arenas, 
There are four phases described in the DEW strategy that an effective resistance movement would move along in order to achieve the ultimate goal of ending the destruction of life once and for all. Starting with networking and mobilization as the first phase, resistors would put down strong roots and gather those who are willing to fight in the phases to come. Then moving up through sabotage and asymmetric action, where the above ground creates a strong presence and engages in campaigns that will pave the way for large and decisive actions in the next phases. Continuing on to the third phase, systems disruption. This would be the time where the larger interconnected arrangements of power would be targeted and held accountable through both above ground and underground actions. In the fourth and final phase, the decisive dismantling of infrastructure all of the framework of civilization as it is now would be crumbled by well-coordinated, decisive actions of an underground resistance. And I can only dream of the phase that would come after that, as Earth breathes a deep sigh of relief, and living communities of all kinds move forward to learn how to live in balance again. So the progression through these phases will look different for every local community that's working with all of the different needs of their respective land bases. It's impossible for us to predict what this life-changing path will look like, but we have to realize that it's up to us to tear down the systems that are in place. It's time for those who are the beneficiaries of a cellular culture to seriously take responsibility for what this culture does. Above-ground work of rebuilding equitable and sustainable communities cannot happen with these systems in place. And the underground work of dismantling these systems cannot happen without equitable and sustainable communities around for whatever comes after. So with these two forms of dynamic resistance happening in harmony with one another, it can be done. The systems of power that are dominating our lives right now can be stopped. They're brittle and they can be broken. So as we take part in this upcoming Above Ground Action Camp, we need to remember the lessons that we can learn from the generations long resistance that's been going on way before we arrived to work in solidarity with the Unistotin. It's essential to dedicate ourselves to stopping the pipeline from coming through Wet'suwet'en territory. And at the same time, it's essential to remember, as Max read in the statement from the grassroots Wet'suwet'en, that there are other pipelines, injection wells, strip mines, nuclear waste sites, oil spills, or I guess we're supposed to call them oil releases now. The list goes on and on. And as we fight the battle in one place, we must also remember the big picture of so many issues that are all connected to the same system of power that needs to be brought down in the end. So with this strategy and the guidance of those who have come before us, we know what we need to do. There are a lot of changes that need to be made, and we need your help. The two things that any resistance movement needs are loyalty and material support. We need loyalty, allies, friends who are willing to defend us, organize with us, stand with us, and talk about this movement. We need material support, food, money, supplies, and shelter. It's been observed that in any given population, the majority of people remain passive about the political state of things, even in times of conflict. It's estimated that only about 20% of the population will either actively support or oppose something like a movement in their area. So if we assume that about half of these people, so 10%, would actively support a movement, it's estimated that only 2% of those people will be taking part in direct conflict. The rest of that 10% is taking action in the form of public backing, feeding their allies, housing them, donating whatever they can in order to keep the movement alive. And this movement that's been brewing and growing for generations now needs your support in whatever form it may take. Not everyone will be up getting arrested. Not everyone will be writing books or speaking in public. Not everyone will even be able to make large donations, but anyone who's motivated to be a part of this movement has something really valuable to offer. If you want to be part of that actively supportive 10% for this action, there are lots of ways for your gifts and energy to be put to good use. Our allies at the camp have requested that we bring things like non-perishable food, camping gear, rope, white gas fuel, blankets, and other useful items for a camp like that. We need as much as we can to keep that camp going as long as necessary until we win. 
If anyone wishes to send a statement of solidarity on behalf of yourself, a tribe, or organization, please talk to us and we can write this down. That kind of loyalty is invaluable. It keeps us fighting even when our allies can't be there beside us. And you can also support this tour and the action camp by buying the books that we brought along. So loyalty and material support can look really different. But we ask each of you to think on these concepts and come to us or others in this struggle and donate whatever you can. Now that you've heard us speak tonight, you have the opportunity to take that awareness with you after this. We're only passing through here today, but each of you living here can spread this knowledge and passion to your communities and the work that you do. And that's a way to keep this movement alive too, because this movement is still breathing right now. There's only a few of us, but we're growing, and we have truth on our side. And the struggle has been long, it's been tough, but we can be sure that our victory will be well underway when the loudest sound on the crumbling highways is birdsong. When there are wolves prowling the regraining canyons of New York City. When oak trees wrap their thick roots around the buildings of Los Angeles and pull them to the ground. That long sought dream of so many is within reach once we realize that it can be done. Once we dedicate our hearts and our lives to the fight.